All right. Well, I'll tell you what, if you would, open your Bible. Oh, by the way, tonight begins Rosh Hashanah. So, Happy New Year to our Jewish friends. Uh, and in other news, today's National Coffee Day. So, hey, <laughs> some mugs up, everybody. So, Got to make sure you cover all the important stuff. By the way, who does this belong to? This was left at our potluck next, last week. And it'll be the churches, maybe, if no one claims it. So, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have anything else they want me to say while I'm on a thing here? But okay. So if you would open your Bibles to John chapter 6. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll get one to you. We'd love for you to have one. And uh, certainly you can keep it as well. All right. So John chapter 6. All right. I'm going to go ahead and read the first 15 verses. That'll give us our context this morning. John writes these words, beginning in chapter 6, verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him, because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said this to him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii are not worth, uh, are, uh, worth of bread would not be enough uh, for each of them to get a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. And now there was much grass in the place, and so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. And so they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the bar, uh, five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw what they had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The Father, as always, we long to understand and, and see what it is you want us to see in these words. And so we pray that, Father, as we spend time in them this morning, that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand. And not only to understand, but ultimately to apply those truths that can make us more like Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you that your word doesn't return void, but it accomplishes that which you set it out to do. And we do pray that here in this place, there would be a, a wonderful opportunity for the Holy Spirit to take the seed of your word and to plant it into fertile ground in the hearts of all of us who are gathered. And we pray that, Father, you be glorified in all these things, both here in this place and as we take this word with us out. And so we love you and thank you and just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, after these things, metatout is the word that John tends to use a lot, actually both in his gospel and also in the book of Revelation. We see this term quite a bit, and uh, it means after these things or after this. And so it's John's way of sort of marking time between some events and other events. But that doesn't mean necessarily that in every case that the events that he begins to speak about after using that phrase immediately take place after what just happened. As a matter of fact, it is very very likely that at least six to twelve months have taken place between chapter five and chapter six, which, by the way, would help illuminate a little bit more verse two, where it talks about them seeing the works that he's been doing among the sick. By this point in Jesus' ministry, certainly by this point, and if, if maybe not even specifically between ver uh, chapters five and six, he has shared many of his parables. Uh, that you read about in Matthew and in Luke particularly. Many of those parables are shared during this time. Uh, he has healed many of the sick. He's done all kinds of miraculous things. And also, by this point, John the Baptist has now been beheaded. And so a lot has happened up to this point. John is just particular about the way he writes his gospel. It's helpful, by the way, to, as we go through John's gospel, to take some time periodically and sort of track along in the other three as well to get a rounder picture. Uh, I've often thought about taking the gospels all four together and doing a chronological version, but I have yet to meet anybody who's done that in less than about five years. And so um, I'm, I'm, I haven't chosen to do that yet. Maybe someday if the Lord tarries. But that being said, because we can't cover all of this 
on a Sunday morning, I would just encourage you to read the other Gospels as well as we go through. John, again, has a very specific purpose in mind. The three other Gospels, which are generally grouped together in what are called synoptic, or they're very similar in many, many ways. They contain a lot of the same information. Um, they have different particulars about why they're written the way they are, but John seems to have this really hyper-specific reason for writing his Gospel. And it it's comes out at the end of the Gospel where he says that these things that that we've written. In other words, the works and the words and the and the and, and such that John has chosen specifically to put in this gospel are written that you might believe and that by believing you might have life in his name. He's just very overt about it. There's nothing, you don't have to wonder why John chose to write. You might even wonder if three other gospels have already been run, written by this time, why write a fourth? Well, of course, he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But you'll notice as John writes, he doesn't include a lot of things that are included in the other Gospels because they've already been said. They've already been shared. However, this particular miracle is the only one that appears in all four other than the resurrection. So this particular miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, does find a place in all four Gospels, but it's the only thing that John shares that finds its place in all four. And so it's significant. And there are things that he wants us to learn from this, and the Holy Spirit wants us to learn about these things. Now, it's probably worth mentioning, too, that by this time, Jesus has begun to appear on Antipas's radar as well. Uh, when you uh, go through the Gospels, you'll see that the Herod, who is ruling during that particular time in that particular area, uh, one of the other Gospels right about this time points out that Antipas is kind of uh, curious about Jesus at this point. He's growing in his understanding or, or knowledge of of this this rabbi coming on the scene and doing some miraculous things. Now, of course, Pilate um, would also be, uh, at some point, he'd become aware as well. But the leadership in Rome, specifically Herod, um, has a very uh, vested interest in making sure that the Jews don't get out of hand and start uprising in his territory. Uh, these various tetrarchs of these areas, and then, of course, later when we see Pilate has the same motivation, wanting to make sure that anybody who rises up and takes prominence uh, is kept in check. Now, this particular, I say I like to say this, in this particular event, 5,000 just men, Matthew tells us not counting the women and children, a very, very large number of people have been following Jesus and are now settling in this place. And Mark tells us, and John doesn't include this detail, but Mark tells us that they've been listening to Jesus teach all day. Some in, somewhere in and about this whole thing unfolding as John reports it, there's a fuller picture going on. They've been following Jesus, again in one of the other Gospels, I think it's Matthew, uh, Maybe it's Mark, actually, where, uh, where Jesus calls his disciples to come aside for a while and rest. But they don't really get much of an opportunity because the crowds that have been following him, and the idea here is that they are continually following him. Why? Because he is regularly performing miracles, and they're recognizing something very special about Jesus. And so they're following him all over the place, and their numbers are growing. And Jesus, as any good leader, wants to give his guys an opportunity to come away for a while. Uh, we don't see it as much in John's Gospel as we do say in Luke's, but there's a lot of very personal human interaction between Jesus and his disciples that is worth noting. When we come to this particular episode, if, again, if I can borrow from the other accounts, Jesus is calling his disciples to take a break. However, and, and by the way, that is an important lesson too. If you serve, if you're in ministry, no matter what you do, there needs to be times when you turn the phone off. There needs to be times when you come away, when you take a break. There needs to be time that you spend alone with the Lord on a regular basis so that you can be of any use at all to anyone else. Uh, I have had seasons of my ministry where I've not taken breaks, I've not taken any kind of a rest, and it probably showed, and it probably made me quite ineffective at times. Now, I don't believe in taking six months sabbaticals twice a year, but I do think that it's important once in a while to take a little time and to take a break. And so I will go with my family and take vacations, and I won't answer a lot of emails during that time. But there are other people to handle that stuff. Anybody in ministry needs to do that from time to time. Having said that, let me flip the coin over for a moment. Jesus' intention, as we see in the other Gospels, is that his disciples get a break. However, they didn't get to have one very long. 
because as Jesus looks out, and again, John doesn't include this particular detail. I think it's Matthew that says, but he looked upon them as they came up the hill to where he was, and he had compassion on them. And so while it's good to schedule a break, you also do have to recognize that maybe from time to time, God has something different on your schedule for that moment. It's a tension that we just have to live with then, but we have to be proactive about it and yet flexible enough to let the Lord decide to change things in the moment. And that's one of those episodes right here. The disciples had intended to take a little rest because also, by the way, not mentioned by John, but mentioned by, I think it's Matthew and Luke, talked about how Jesus has just sent his disciples on their first missionary journey. He told them just to take enough with them, not two bags and all these kinds of things, but just to go. And when they needed something, trust that God would take care of it. And they've come back now. And it was basically, if you've, ever, if you've been a missionary, you understand the concept of debriefing and the idea of taking a little time now to discuss what's going on. And they did, and they glorified the Lord. But nonetheless, this would turn out to be a very short time of rest, sort of a pit stop before it was time to get back to work. And with all that background, we find ourselves once again back here in John chapter 6. And notice in verse 1, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is uh, the Sea of Tiberias. This particular body of water is called by a number of different names in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, it's called Chinnereth, it's called Gennesaret, uh, it's called Tiberias here, it's called the Sea of Galilee. What likely is in play here is as Jesus and the disciples took a boat across the Sea of Galilee, which is about 12 miles long and 6 miles wide, and they went across the other side to the area of Tiberias. And so as they were there, the crowds came around the other side. So they would have likely been able to see this mass of about not just 5,000, but if you count the women and potential children, there could have been, estimates go as high as 20,000, but let's just say somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people. Now this would have certainly caught Herod's attention, this would certainly have caught Pilate's attention, this certainly would have caught anyone's attention that a, a, a rabbi's got this kind of a following. For our purposes this morning though, it's enough to just recognize that Jesus and the disciples sitting up on a hillside likely saw the crowds coming their way. And so it's good to just paint a picture of the scene as we look at these things. Well. As Jesus has returned now to this northern region, remember last time he was in Jerusalem uh, and he had done some healing and the Passover is coming up once again. Uh, people are, are eventually going to start making their way to Jerusalem again. But right now he's back in the area of Galilee, not far away from where he did his first miracles there at Canaan and such. Uh, so as they're in this area there... Um, it says again in verse 2 that a large crowd following him because they saw the signs that Jesus was doing on the sick. Now he would commend them for this in a sense a little later in this same chapter. It's, he sort of compares their reasons for following him then with sort of what they're doing now. At this point, they're following because they're curious about what he's doing. He's fulfilling the things that Messiah would do. Later on, after Jesus feeds them, as we're going to see, later on they come back the next day, but Jesus knows their hearts and recognizes they've only come back for breakfast. And so, but at this particular point, they are on the right track. Not everyone who follows Jesus, even at this time, will follow him even beyond the cross. But by and large, they're curious about him for the right reasons. John has bore witness of him. They're following him. They're wanting to know about him. And Jesus sees the crowd coming toward them. So he went up on the mountain, verse 3, or on the high place, and there sat down with his disciples. Now again, Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. And uh, as it mentions the Passover here, this is one of three that we know specifically that John mentions. He mentions his first the first Passover that Jesus attends is in chapter 2, where he clears the temple out for the first time. Uh, the second one is the one that is mentioned here, likely referring to the one that shows up in chapter 7, verse 1, and then later on in chapter 11, the third and final Passover that's mentioned uh, is brought out, and this becomes Jesus now as he is in his ministry there in Jerusalem. And so, uh, as the Passover is near... Um, uh, 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 the crowds are starting to gather again, and they're going to make their way toward Jerusalem soon, but right now they're standing, uh, they're following him. Now Jesus, verse 5, lifts up his eyes, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus says to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii, uh, denarii uh, worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. Um, John adds the insight. 
that Jesus, of course, knew what he was going to do. John's writing 60 years later. I mean, he's had lots of time to think about what he's writing. And he looks back on this time and recognizes that Jesus didn't wonder, really. Uh, you know, somebody who had the power to heal and raise the dead and all these kinds of things, really wasn't going to worry about catering too much. Uh, and so he simply said this to lay out a dilemma for his disciples. Now, the other accounts talk about how his disciples are asking him, what are we going to do? And, and here Jesus specifically, John specifically mentions two disciples among the group that were also very curious about what they were going to do when the multitudes came. Now, again, remember, they have been there now. John is just being specific about pointing out certain details. But during the course of this time, they have been listening to Jesus for all, for all day. And Jesus is rightly wanting to make sure they're taken care of physically. And so he puts it to Philip in the midst of this discussion with the disciples. He says to Philip, you know, what are we going to do here? And Philip, and I love the team dynamics among the disciples. Um, every little detail that you read about in the Gospels, take a moment to consider why it's there. Uh, in this particular account, we see two of the disciples pointed out. Philip is mentioned first, and Philip mentions, sort of sees it kind of like a board member might, or like the church accountant might. He says, Philip, where are we going to get enough to feed these people? Now, Philip, by the way, is from this area. Okay, they're close to where Philip grew up, so it's, it's not an unusual thing that Philip would be singled out here. And Philip does something that most of us probably might do. We survey the crowd, and we think about how much money it would cost to feed them. Okay. Now at this point, there's ten to fifteen thousand people. That's not an unlogical or uh, an unreasonable thing to do. Okay. Now Philip's not thinking Jesus is going to do what he's about to do. He's thinking very practically, very pragmatically. What must I do here to sort of figure? To, to sort of gets a thumbnail survey of the crowd, sees the, the massive size of it, and says, you know, if we had two hundred denarii, which by the way is two hundred days' wages for the average worker. Okay, so if we had enough money that a worker would make in roughly seven months, that would not be enough to feed this crowd. Okay, and so Philip looks at it very pragmatically. I don't have any idea what we're going to do. How on earth are we going to deal with this? And then Andrew shows up. Now we don't see Andrew a lot in the New Testament, but most of the time when we do, he's involved in bringing someone to Jesus. Early on. He goes and he brings uh, his brother to meet Jesus, right? Andrew is Simon Peter's brother. Well, after Andrew meets him, he goes to get Peter. Uh, later on, there are some Greeks that want to see Jesus, and, Phil and Philip and uh, Andrew, and I think it's Nathaniel are there. And they ask, you know, they come to these two, and they say, we want to see Jesus. And Andrew goes and tells them what's going on and everything. Um, and so we don't see a lot about Andrew, but this is the kind of thing we see with him. The other example, of course, is here. Andrew brings up, and the word there is a lad, a small boy, a kid. And um, this is really a fun account to talk about, uh, because most of the time we sort of have a, a picture of what's in view here. Uh, and we're prone by human nature to sort of, even in, sort, in the clearly the bigger problem than they have the means to provide for, we still tend to see the resources that are brought to bear as being bigger than they are. We don't recognize how few the vittles really are for the muchness of the people. So he finds a boy, and this kid has essentially got some flat, when you say barley loaves, this is the kind of stuff you'd throw the animals. Uh, it's, it was a flat Probably the best way to think about it would imagine an unleavened tortilla about as thick as your pinky, like a little flapjack kind of thing. And the fish that are talked about are little fish. They're the kind of fish you would sort of garnish the bread with. Some have referred to it as like a relish kind of a thing that you'd spread on the, that you'd sort of cut up and just sort of put on this little bit of bread. The food that this kid brought was only enough for him and barely enough at that. Okay. In other words, it wasn't like they ran. They had this kid had like this 38 foot long Subway sandwich or something that somehow they managed to whittle small enough for everybody to get a bite. No, it's 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 almost like the Gideon story when God calls Gideon and says, "Hey." Gather up the men. I'm going to use you to do something amazing. So Gideon gathers everybody up, and God says it's too many. 
Now, they're already outnumbered 3 to 1. I think they had 30,000 guys initially. They're outnumbered 3 to 1, and God said it's too many. So they whittle it down. It gets down to 10,000. No. Then 1,000. No. Now, finally, finally 300 guys. So ludicrously outnumbered were they that there was just no possible way this could have been anybody but God that gave them victory. Well, the same kind of a thing is happening here. There is so little food that it is laughable to think that they would have the means to provide for this many people. But that's exactly what Jesus wanted to demonstrate. Now again, let's pick up the story. Now again, he said these things, verse 6, to test him for himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them uh, to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Absolutely, what are they for so many? Now that you know what they're looking at, you can see how absolutely insane this all seems. And so Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, again, I'm going to borrow from the other Gospels. When it not only says have them sit down, uh, but have them sit in groups. They're broken down into certain size groups that were somewhat manageable for the food distribution when it came time. Uh, Jesus, again, knew what he was going to do, so he just simply prepared the people for what he was about to do and sort of in an organized way set them up so that when the food was brought to them, it could be brought to them and everybody could, could get some. Uh, and so there's a certain organizational thing here. Those of you who are OCD will appreciate such details. Uh, but Jesus takes sort of an orderly way of approaching this. And he gets them to sit down in a certain way so they can be served. Uh, and then it goes on. Interestingly, I think it's Mark that also talks about how it's the green grass and everything. But now there was much grass, again, green grass in the place. And so the men sat down, again, 5, 000, about 5,000 in number. We're actually looking at more like around 15-ish or something. Jesus then took the loaves. Again, loaves is such a gratuitous trans, uh, translation of this term. Took these little, you know, tortillas, essentially. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. Now, the other Gospels say something similar. He blessed the food or he gave thanks. Um, it's, it's probable that he used a very typical kind of a blessing that went something like this. You know, blessed be you, God of the universe, from whom uh, all, uh, who brings bread from the earth, and this kind of a blessing that he lay on this. Now, remember, the disciples know what's going on. Right now, nobody else really knows what's happening just yet. They'll, they'll realize it later, John uh, uh, includes the detail. But right now, it's just Jesus and the disciples, by and large, that know what's going on. The disciples are looking at this little pile of food that basically would fill a Ziploc bag. And they see in there a massive problem. How are we going to deal with this? But Jesus here sees an opportunity to teach them some very important lessons, and by extension, us. And so he blesses the food, and he begins to distribute it. Now, of course, he didn't walk up and down all the aisles likely, but the disciples likely helped him distribute it, much like he often does in ministry. Certainly, he could do ministry much better than any one of us, but nonetheless, he calls us and employs us in that work. But so the food is being passed out, and everybody didn't just get a bite. Everybody ate until they were filled with that little insignificant amount of food. Now, sadly, there are those uh, who take this account and try to make it sound, I think William Barclay is one of them, who, for some reason, he always wants to write off the miracles of Jesus as some kind of natural explanation. But in this particular one, and there are others who do the same thing, the, their interpretation of the story goes something like this, that Andrew brought this kid up to Jesus with this little sack lunch, and when Jesus began to bless the food and, and the crowd saw this little kid that was willing to give up of his own food, that Jesus might pass some of it out, everybody felt guilty, and they sort of took out their own lunches and they started to share it with everybody and all this kind of thing. Uh, that's unfortunate for a lot of reasons, but not the least of which is that it completely diminishes something Jesus is trying to teach through these events. Uh, let me just stop for a moment to say... Don't be stunned at the miracles that Jesus does. John's entire gospel is written not to portray Jesus as a miracle worker, simply, or a great teacher, simply, but as God in human flesh.
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word what? Was God, right? John harbored no illusions about the identity of Jesus. And by the way, so neither did so many early on in the church's history. There are always those that had problems with the concept, but that's never really been a, a problem for so many that have followed the Christian faith. Well, if you understand that Jesus is God, then the concept of multiplying elements of bread and fish is nothing, right? Remember, he speaks to the weather and it obeys him. He calls the dead back to life. He heals the sick as though it were nothing. For him to multiply some food is simple. Simple. And so he multiplies this food. And, and, and we see this, this sort of picture of, of him just handing food to the disciples. And then they would go and pass it out to the multitude. And you've got to wonder, every time they came back to get another pile to, to pass out, there just seems to be more. Where is it coming from? How is this happening? We know what there was to start with. But how's the, what's happening here? And so they eat, and they're not just, again, they didn't get a taste or a sample. They were filled. They ate until they were full, fully satisfied. So thoroughly had Jesus taken care of the problem. That which seemed completely insurmountable to his closest disciples, certainly would have been insurmountable to the multitudes, was nothing for him. And it stood as a lesson. Actually, there's a number of lessons that we learn ultimately from this. First off... I think the most obvious is that Jesus' intention was for his disciples to recognize that there will be times in ministry when you will be confronted with things that only Jesus can address. You'll be confronted with problems that are so big for you that only Jesus can meet it. You know, that's a lesson we never outgrow. Most of us in our Christian lives tend to get so sophisticated in our Christianity that we sort of lose sight of the fact that our lives are not about learning self-sufficiency, but are about learning Christ's sufficiency. When we find our backs against the wall and we have no capacity to step away from the wall, we have no ability to get up off the ground, we have no ability to even see the end of what's going on right now. Jesus is not trying to teach us to be self-sufficient. He's teaching us to look up, to call out to him. God help us to never lose sight of that simple truth. It sounds so childish, and it should. That's exactly the kind of faith, not a, childish is the wrong world, but childlike. That's the kind of faith he wants us to have, the kind of faith that doesn't have to figure it out first, but trust that dad has got it handled. Much the same way a small child might, when they have no idea what in the world is going on around them. If they understood everything that was at play, their little minds would explode. But instead, they just know Dad's got it handled. Well, that's the kind of faith he calls us to have. And there's something very refreshing about that simplicity. And believe me, I'm not somebody who sets aside thinking. I, mean, I, I love plumbing the deep things about what it means to know God personally. I love digging into the hard things and trying to sort them out. But there... And I would never discourage that with anybody. But lest we forget the simplicity of what it means to follow after, not the rules, not just the, the, the precepts and everything in and of themselves, but the person that underlies them all. It's Jesus that we follow. It's the person, right? That's an important lesson for us, not only to learn, but to never, ever forget. And so Jesus teaches his disciples that they're going to confront things in their ministry. And they've already got a little taste of that on their missionary journey. There were times when they needed something and they saw God provide. They saw, uh, God, you know, they saw demons cast out and all these different things that they would do as they served him. Things that were beyond them. They began to learn those lessons. Well, this was another one of those they could put in their back pocket and say, remember when Jesus did this? Next time they were on the road and they found themselves overwhelmed at what was going on around them, they'd be able to look at this instance and say, you know, God met our need right then. Nothing was too big. Nothing was too great for him. And so they were going to learn this lesson as important as it is. Of course, many of you know this, but turn to Philippians chapter 4 for just a moment. If you don't have this underlined in your Bible or highlighted or something, let me encourage you to get your pen out and do it. This is one of those practical realities 
practical truths that really invades our realities that we need to hold on to. And so many passages we sort of have in the back of our minds, but we forget how poignant they are in the moment. And this might be one of those moments for some of you here today. Matter of fact, I know it is. Now remember, Paul is writing from prison. And he's writing this letter, and it, is, it, it really spans the spectrum of emotion. Because in one place, he is speaking of how discouraged he's been at some point. But here at the end of the letter, he talks about how whether I have much or I have little, whether I abase or I abound, I've learned in all things to be content because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We all know Philippians 4.13. That's the context of it. Well, notice a little further down in, in, in verse 19, where he tells them... He knows this truth, but he's telling them in Philippi the same thing now that he's learned. He's helping them understand it, and he encapsulates it in this simple statement that we ought to underline, remember, and draw upon when we find ourselves in similar circumstances. He says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. My God will supply all of your need. Right? My God will supply all of your need. There is nothing short of a call to utter dependence upon Jesus. A dependence upon God for our needs in our circumstances. It is such a simple truth, but one that we avoid as much as we possibly can because we don't like waiting to see if God, if God will do it. I can tell you from experience, and I am absolutely certain that any one of you could probably testify similarly to how God has met you in a moment like that. Do you remember it? Do you remember it specifically? Can you remember what you were going through? Can you remember the moment and what you felt like when you thought everything was lost and there was nothing to fall back on? And then he showed up and he did something that completely solved the problem, that met the need, that allowed you to keep on going. That's not a deep thought, is it? It doesn't require a scholar to understand such things. A small child can get their mind around that. God help us to never get so sophisticated in our Christian lives that we forget the simplicity and the beauty of the simplicity of that truth. The same Jesus who fed the, the, the people of Israel in the wilderness is the same one who fed the multitudes here on this hillside and is the same one who meets our needs today. God has not changed. His capacity, His resources, His ability, and His care and concern for you has not changed one bit. And in this moment, the disciples needed to learn that lesson because they were going to face tremendous hardships. They were going to face times where they were alone. They were going to face times where they had no resource. They would have to depend upon God's provision. And God's provision does come sometimes practically too, by the way, right? There's nothing... There's, there have been... Uh, I will tell you, there was a time when Julie and I, and Nina, but we were completely at the end of our financial rope. Had nothing. And literally, I kid you not, on that day, a knock at the door came, and a couple of friends showed up that didn't even live in the state. And they came and they dropped off a check for us, or cash actually, as I remember, like five grand out of nowhere they didn't know we didn't call you none of you guys knew nothing literally and there they were at the door when we were adopting Nina there were times in that process and that was not a cheap process but there were times along the way where we knew God had called us to go through with the adoption, but we were starting to run low on resources, and there'd be an envelope in the door, or somebody at church would drop something in the, in the basket or something like that. God uses people sometimes to meet needs miraculously. We never limit the way God chooses to do something, but He does. My God will provide all your need according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Well, the disciples and his current day disciples, those who follow and are learners of Jesus, need to know these things and remember them. When you find yourself in a place where you are serving him and you've come to the end of your rope, we call out to him and we ask him to intervene, to meet with us, and he does. That's a lesson that we never get too old to learn.
The other lesson that I would point out that he wants them to learn, back in John again, but also generosity. Okay, the simple concept of being generous. Um, we should be careful never to think that if God chooses to supply only so much in a given moment, that he is somehow being stingy about things. Because what he may not supply in money or, or practical material resources, he may be supplying in lessons and in growth and in fruit in ways that we would not otherwise be able to produce or be involved in his producing. But basic generosity is something that's at the heart of God. Notice, Jesus didn't multiply the food and just give everybody a little taste just to sustain them until they could go home and get dinner. No, he satisfied them. They were filled. Absolutely filled. In Proverbs 11, matter of fact, turn to this as well, Proverbs chapter 11. By the way, if, you're, if you have trouble studying the Word of God and you're not sure where to start, at the very least, every day, read a chapter of Proverbs. You'll find that as you get through the book, there's about as many chapters of Proverbs as there is in a month, right? Well, that's a good thing for us to get in the habit of, to just read one chapter a day. Read more than that, certainly, but read one chapter of Proverbs a day. You'll be wise, uh, wiser for it. But in chapter 11 of, of, uh, uh, of Proverbs, in verse 24, again, a very simple truth, but it's one that is not just intended to speak of God's generosity directly so much, as much as he's directing us to be generous in our thinking. Notice in verse 24, again, or in verse 24, one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Now these are observations that Solomon recognized. He recognized that those who were generous of heart and of spirit, oftentimes God would bless in return in ways. I like to say it this way. If you're somebody that money just sort of goes through your fingers and is distributed as you see need, God, you're generally the kind of person that God continues to bless financially because he knows that you're just going to spread it out where he kind of directs you. However, if you're somebody who kind of steps away from that idea of being generous and instead hoards because you're worried that you're not going to have enough, oftentimes God allows you to experience the kind of want that would teach you to be generous instead. Why? Because that's God's heart. Uh, I think it was Vance Havner said, you know, if you've got a stingy, if you think, if, oh gosh, how did he put it? So it's something to the effect of if you, if you have an impression of God that makes him out to be stingy, don't blame him. You've just seen other people maybe reflecting some version of that or something. But God's heart is very, very generous. He's got endless resources, which means he can be as generous as he wants to be, but he can also be generous through you as much as he wants to be. It's much more about the kind of heart and attitude that we bring. Well, again, fundamental lessons for disciples who are about to go out into the world and represent him to a world. They were going to see Jesus by looking at them. The world, I should say, was going to see Jesus by looking at the disciples, much as they do today. When the world sees a people that is generous in spirit, generous of heart, giving by nature, maybe better to put giving by new nature, this is something that impacts people deeply. When they recognize how cold and callous the world can be, but yet a Christian comes and is willing to give their last few bucks in order to help somebody out of a jam, or maybe buys them lunch or does something like this, or gives of their time to somebody who maybe doesn't ever get that benefit from anybody else. That reflects the heart of Jesus profoundly. And frankly, it often gives us an opportunity to talk about this God who we've experienced his generosity, and we can explain to them why we're now generous to them. That is really at the heart of ministry. And this is something these 12 were going to have to learn, and Jesus was instilling in them in, in no uncertain ways. So, moving back to John chapter 6. In verse 14... Or I'm sorry, in uh, verse 13, uh, verse 12 and 13, Jesus tells them, uh, When they'd eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. Uh, for those of you who believe in, you know, waste not, want not, there you go. you got a Bible verse to back you up right now. Jesus tells them to collect up all the leftovers, right? Don't just leave it all laying around. Pick it up. How many did they collect? Twelve baskets. How many disciples were there? Twelve. You think they each took a little lesson home? 
Yeah. Uh, there's a certain wonderful, beautiful, hilarious irony in this. Um, somebody pointed out to you, and I, I, I've, I've spent some time looking, and I haven't found this personally, uh, but I like the idea behind it. I'll share it. Again, not saying that I know this is for certain, um, but uh, this, this, this author made a connection between the idea of these baskets, and the word for basket, there's not a big giant basket necessarily, but it's a basket that made the point. They, they were collected enough to fill 12 of these, but they were servant's baskets, They were, which would make more sense. Nobody would be carrying these big giant laundry baskets around. But likely they would have had something with which to carry this. Well, um, the, the case is being made that it's, it's a servant's basket, and in essence, Jesus was not teaching them about his own capacity to meet needs, but their own capacity to recognize their place as servants. Um, take it for what it's worth. I find it as an interesting insight. I will say this before we finish the passage, though. Um, the, um, the word thanks there, where Jesus gives thanks for the food, that's where we get our word Eucharist from, the idea of thanksgiving. Okay, now I'm Catholic, and I used to be Catholic. Anybody in here who used to be Catholic will shudder when they hear the word Eucharist. We're not talking about the real presence of Jesus and the bread or any of this kind of stuff. But the word itself simply means thanksgiving. And so when we break bread and we come to the table, we don't use the word because it often brings back sort of connotations of our past and in a different context and such. But really, it's important to recognize that the word simply means thanksgiving. And uh, Eucharisto is actually the Greek there that is used by John uh, in talking about the thanksgiving. And it simply means that as they broke bread together, and of course there's probably wonderful symbolism there I mean, that the Holy Spirit may want us to grasp about this idea of breaking bread together and the fellowship that is involved in those kinds of things. But there is something in this miracle of Jesus feeding these multitudes in this way that was intended to sort of teach the disciples this lesson to, in, their, in, in all of those people's minds, when you broke bread together, you were fellowshipping together. On the one hand, somebody like a Herod or a Pilate would have seen this gathering and been worried that this rabble-rousing rabbi might be gathering his, his one-day troops together and he's, you know, 10, 10 to 15,000 people can make a difference if this leader told him to go and charge on Rome or some kind of a thing like this. But that was never, that was never Jesus' intention, even though at the end of the passage, if you notice... In verse 14, they're recognizing him as the prophet who is to come into the world, referring to that prophet that Moses spoke of. We talked about this last week in Deuteronomy 18. The prophet who is to come into the world, the one who is the coming Messiah. They're acknowledging that's who Jesus is. And in verse 15, when Jesus perceives that they're about to take him by force to make him king, that would have been everything that Pilate and Herod would have been preparing for. But that wasn't Jesus' intention. As a matter of fact, it was never his intention on the first visit to establish his kingdom on earth. His first mission was to vanquish the greatest foe of all, and that is sin and Satan. When he comes back, on the other hand, it's going to be different. Now all those desires, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that will be fulfilled. We'll see that come to pass. But in this particular instance, it was about something else. And plus, Jesus also knew their hearts. He wasn't going to commit himself to them, even as John recorded earlier in his gospel. He recognized that their desire to make him king at this point wasn't yet on the mark. And Jesus knew this. The time was not yet come. We see this, by the way, through the gospels, where they want to take him and put him forth and everything. But his time had not yet come, so he might make his way through the crowds and those kinds of things. He was on a divine timetable, and now was not the time just yet. So that said, we'll pick up and continue through this gospel next time. But any questions or thoughts before we, before we pray and close? Yeah, Vance. Just to your point, um, I'm not real big on buzzwords or catchphrases, typically. Yeah. Um, again, to your point, uh, I remember a pastor I've known for years said several years ago, speaking about anxiety and fears and edginess that some of us go through from time to time. Yeah. Even though, you know, Paul said in Philippians, being anxious for nothing, sometimes we are attacked with anxiety. Sure. But he said, God is not nervous. <laughs> and I really need to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it was a good point. Shall I hear that? God is not nervous. He's not nervous. You know, in, in Philippians. 
That's right. I remember uh, again earlier in Philippians, another passage will mention, be anxious for nothing. But in all things with prayer and supplication, make your request be made known to God, and the, and, and the God of peace will, uh, will grant you peace that passes all understanding, guarding your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Um, by the way, please don't ever get beat up by that verse. If you find yourself anxious, that's not Paul clubbing you and saying, you're not supposed to be anxious. No. The fact is he's addressing the fact that many are anxious. And Paul himself had bouts of anxiety, right? And he found himself despairing even of life at times, we read him talking about. But yet he recognizes, really, by turning that over to the Lord, there is, the, there is now the freedom to experience the peace that will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Um, and it's rooted in the fact that for God, this is not a problem, right? God's not nervous. God's not anxious about what's happening. As a matter of fact, in those circumstances, God is often using them to hone you and make you a much more usable uh, vessel of honor in his hands for whatever he might have for you later. Um, that's a great one. God's not nervous. Love that. Anyone else? Yeah, Stephanie. Great question. Uh, typically, the standard view was is that uh, the Messiah would be a military leader who would overthrow the yoke of their oppressors and set Israel up as the kingdom from which Messiah would reign. Um, and you see this hinted at throughout, and in some places not even hinted at, overtly. Um, matter of fact, when the scribes and Pharisees had such a problem with him, uh, there came a point, uh, matter of fact, probably one of the best examples on, on, in terms of their interaction was um, on the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, uh, Zechariah 9.9, and he'll, he'll, he'll ride into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey and all of this kind of thing. Well, Jesus very specifically fulfills that prophecy on the very specific day that Daniel talked about. Now, we don't get, we, it's never clearly stated in the Gospels that the Pharisees recognized they recognized what he was doing by coming in on the donkey, he was proclaiming himself to be Messiah. But we never see in there where where they where they make it they make it clear that they know this is the day. But the people, whether they recognized it was the specific day Daniel had prophesied or not, Jesus held them accountable to know it. But when he rode in. Uh, and the people were crying Hosanna, and they were recognizing him as Messiah, uh, the Pharisees and scribes told Jesus to quiet his disciples. And it was likely out of fear of the Romans, because if, if everybody's rising up now to follow this new king, well, you better be, because if you're not, we're about to get our tails handed to us, you know? So... Um, so that, and, and even after the resurrection, when Jesus meets with his disciples, we see this in Acts chapter 1, where Jesus meets with his disciples after the resurrection, and he's talking to them, and he's about to ascend into heaven, and they ask him a very specific question, which was very much the expectation of Israel. Will you at this time restore your kingdom? Uh, and he says, the times and the seasons are not for you to know. You know, in other words, I'm not going to give you the answer to that. But that was the expectation. That was what their mindset was. And so when it came to Messiah, it certainly had nothing to do with taking away the sins of the world. You know, that was not something that they were thinking of with Messiah. Um, which makes it interesting when you read the passages in the Old Testament. Uh, when you read Isaiah 53 and passages like this, typically uh, Jewish rabbis throughout history have interpreted that primarily as being Israel suffering. Israel is the suffering servant, not Messiah himself specifically. So the, the stripes on the back, the plucking of the beard, the um, hardly recognizable as a man and all these kinds of things, and Psalm 22, same kind of thing, um, they're generally not interpreted personally as Messiah as much as Israel as a nation suffering uh, because that's their mindset. And even today that remains. You know, um, if you go to Israel today, um, you will see messianic signs up on walls. Um, generally, there's a lot of skirmish up there, too. But you will periodically see where there's an expectation of Messiah coming. Uh, and they'll be excited about it. Some will be excited about it. Um, not all. I mean, there tends to be a shift in Israel right now, becoming much more secular in some quarters. Um, but by and large, that is the view of Messiah. So great question. Um, anyone else? All right. 
Well, let's pray, and then let's go ahead and sing, and we'll dismiss. Father, thank you for our time here this morning. We thank you that we can spend this time looking uh, at the words, the works, the person, the activity, the interactions of our Savior Jesus. And we just pray that, Father, you would help us to see him all the more clearly as we continue to make our way through your word. And we thank you, Father, that your desire is for us to learn day after day to trust him more. Father, help us to never become so sophisticated in our Christian lives that we lose sight of the simple faith that you've called us to walk by. You've given us answers to hard questions, no doubt, but not so that we might move away from depending upon you, but rather that we might know just how dependable you are. So help us, Lord, to learn and to anchor ourselves to you in that way. Father, I pray for any among us even right now who are maybe struggling through some very difficult times. I know there are some. And I pray that, Father, in you they would find security. In you they would find safety. In you they would find assurance that you're going to carry them through this. And that, Father, you'll help them to stand as they put their trust in you, practically speaking, in this circumstance. And, Father, help us all not to separate our faith in, in, in you for our salvation and our trust in you for the practical things in life. Help those two things to abide together in our hearts and minds, comfortably and assuredly. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, we praise you. And just pray that you go out with us, before us, behind us. We know that you already dwell within us. So help us to go out and just simply be followers of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If anybody would like prayer, come on up after we sing. But let's go ahead and stand together and close.